Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm Tony Morrison with a, a little organization called GLAD with you tonight, if you ever heard. Very little. Um, and thank you for joining us. GLAD um, focuses on representation and visibility in media. And to talk more about that, Jim Parsons, everybody. I'm trying to talk about GLAD. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for being here. Well, I know you all are in a very fragile state right now. But let me hear you. Did you enjoy spoiler alert? Jim? I How would does only it be feel? able to say you don't have to say that because I'm here. That's really <laughs> me. Come on. But, <laughs> but a round of applause. How do you feel? I'll just but thank you. How do you feel that you've got some early reaction from this film? How does it feel for you um, to, to get that feedback? We did a Q&A at a theater last night, and it was the first time I've seen the film with people who bothered to get out of their houses and come to the theater to see it. Otherwise, we had seen it. We had seen it with lots of people, but it had been very um, invited guests and screenings and things like that. It is, uh, it's insanely moving to see it with people who have just come to see it. And I thank you, and I just want you to know it means a lot to me. It really does. I love yeah. that. Well, let's get into it. I mean, you've, you've probably answered this question many, many times about how, how you, uh, yeah. the journey into getting this adapted to film, but you... So Michael Osiello, who <laughs> I play in the film, you want me to tell, tell Well, I was just going to ask you right? what was the, to go a step further than your, Yo, the, the boiler okay, question. Great. What was the, that, what was the impetus that was, you and your husband said, we have to make this into a film? It was my husband. It was him <laughs> watching me read it and crying through it. And he said, should it be a movie? And, and I said, I really honestly don't know. I mean, here's the thing. This is so funny. And I sort of say this to name drop it more because it's the truth. I went to some weird dinner where Francis McDormand sat next to me. And so you are not forced to, but you, you either make conversation through the night or you don't. And one of the things she said the night was, I have found that, that stories that don't really succeed in their original format are the best ones to adapt. So Todd watched me, my husband watched me read this book and sobbed through it and said, do you think it'd be a good movie? And I said, I don't know. And it had a lot to do with Francis because I was like, that just worked the shit out of it as a novel. So does it need to be a movie? And he read it on a plane and he read it and said, I think it does. And, and that's where it started. Yeah. Well, you have a, a very just touching story by uh, someone you've known, Michael Osiello. Michael, yeah. What is the delicacy around treating a story like that and bringing it to film? Um, it's severe, except that Michael was so sane. It was like, I can't tell you the amount of times Michael Osiello said, I understand there's a difference between the story I told and what happened and what the movie is supposed to be. And that was very freeing. The process of building the cast because you're also a producer yeah. in the film what was that process like and at what point did everyone decide or did you decide you had to play the part of Michael I knew immediately I Todd was kind of like iffy on it but I think that was like real life of uh, infringing on artistic life I knew as an actor that Michael was the role for me um yeah and so from that point uh once we got show walter on board and started deciding what was going to happen we 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 found ben and everything came from it. Uh, sally came from show walter i mean she loves show walter thank god and so she said yes for the sake of sharing with this audience you already said the two words sally right. field sally Field. <laughs> yes share with us set life with sally the first day is very intimidating because you know that you're going to have to look her in the eye and the fear is that she's going to look back and go, that's not good, <laughs> you know? And, um, but the bigger story is always that she is an actor's actor. I don't know how else to say that. It's just like, she makes everything better because she accepts nothing less than the truth. And, and I think as actors, you, you obviously all feel that and want that, but like 
it's hard to understand how to be as rigorous as Sally is. She just, she won't stop asking questions. She won't stop demanding answers. And you feel like you're doing your job until you're with her and you're like, oh my God, she won't quit. And it's heaven. It's really heaven. She elevated more scenes in there than she's even aware of. I mean, we did the the scene in the hospital where Kit's dying and Ben's in the bed the whole day and Sally had recently, somewhat recently, put her mother, or her mother had passed while she'd been in the hospital with her or whatever and she brought all of that story and what she thought was right and wrong about that scene story-wise to from her experience to the set and it's not that everyone added their own stories to it but she by just bringing it up made everyone go woof and you brought more in than you ever thought was possible because you're like oh god i do know people who have died and i've it added I don't know if I said it with you or not. I've said it somewhere. It was like it added a pallor to it that was so right for the day. She she dressed that whole day in like what it is to really sit there and lose somebody in a way that was, it was profound and such a fucking pleasure. It was such a pleasure as an actor to get to be a part of something that was meaningful in that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. And in, in, in a way that only I feel Sally can do well i'd like to get there myself <laughs> i'm aiming at it i'm learning from her <laughs> well speaking of story that there were some pieces i guess a, a stylistic piece throughout the film where uh you we, we cut away to a movie set yeah. style into michael's thoughts how did yeah. you or um show walter kind of land on that concept uh a lot of it came from the book the book is very much framed in a kind of tv format like you know previously on or whatever and it's like we have to keep that conceit going. That's that's a beautiful, entertaining, pulling you along. You have a you have a story that's called spoiler alert. We know where we're going. So what is it that keeps us, you know, story wise coming along? And so Dan Savage and David Marshall Grant presented us with a way of looking at it that was these breaks like going out to these unrealistic places and it's very interesting we knew all along that some people would be like cool and some people would be like nah not so much but it didn't matter because the bottom line was you led to a place where it's that last scene where michael breaks out and turns it into an interview and and whether that works for you or not, it's like, that's what it's leading to. It's like, this is a man who frames everything through TV terms, in our movie at least, and somewhat in the book. And that just felt worth it. It felt like finding, it felt worth it to find the way to get there, is to be like, how the hell do I say goodbye to the most important, important person in my life? And, and it was through those terms of, of, of his job and his, his love of TV um, which is the, you know, yeah. I'm not sure I answered that, but I talked a lot. <laughs> well, you've not shied away, certainly your career, from, you know, representing the LGBT community and no. you yourself being that vehicle yeah. representation. Um, you know, Normal Heart, yeah. Poison the Band, just name a couple other titles yeah. here, but what's that been like for you to kind of be that representation? Maybe a maybe gift. representation you a weren't... Gift. You're, yeah. I am not an activist. I didn't know for so long in my life, I didn't know that I would be any sort of mouthpiece for our community or whatever. And I got asked to do all these things. I remember back in 2011, I got asked to do The Normal Heart on Broadway and it became a movie. And then I got asked to do The Boys in the Band and while we were filming that movie, I got asked to do Hollywood, which was also a gay closeted, but just frustrated manager who was also gay. 
the only choice in the gay story that has been this one, which is like, I love this story. And even that I didn't choose because gay. I choose because I identified because I'm gay so closely to it. So I just can't overstate the amount of gifts I've been given and, and and maybe I have something to do with that, with who I am and who I resent as that the people come to me, but so much of the things I've done in the gay vein have been because they've called me and and I love that. I, I sometimes wish that I was more of an activist, that I was more like, but I am who I am and this is how I respond to things and why do I feel like I'm going to cry through the whole answer of that question? It's terrible. Anyway. Well, I will say you don't have to be, my, my pull quote from that is, you don't have to be an activist to tell your story. No, you're right. Or to tell our stories. And I think you're that's right. a beautiful and that's thing. that's something I've learned. You know, I was so scared when I did Normal Heart that Larry Kramer was going to tell me I was a worthless homosexual. Because, like, why aren't you doing, well, he has done it to people. You know? It's like, why aren't you doing more? He was the kindest man to me. He was so empathetic. He was so, he was just so vibrant and wonderful. And, um, and I've, I've, I've kind of gone from there, I think, in a lot of ways, just going, that's really moving to me to have been able to interact with him in that way. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll do what I can, you know. I'll do what I do. I'll do, I'll bring what I bring. You know, I think that's the, the call of an artist is to like, well, yeah. I didn't mean to make you cry. There's, making, there's I'm been I'm a okay. lot of tears okay. shed in this theater I'm tonight okay. already. Um, as, we, as we wrap up our time here, uh, thank you for making some time to be thank here you. with this audience. And I will ask you this as a last question. You and your husband yeah. have been married. I, th I think you're celebrating quite recently We've an anniversary. For 20 years. 20 years. Oh. We got <laughs> thank you. It's only recently I accept that because I'm like, before I was like, well, what's a big deal? It's a good relationship. But now 20 years, Jesus, thank you, yes. So I must ask you, Jim Parsons, yes. what is your secret sauce to a happy life together? Um, it's changed over the years, but I will say currently what it is is allowing the other person to explore whatever they need to explore. I. I, it's very, it can be very threatening to watch somebody realize dreams for themselves that you're like, how does that include me? But it all includes you, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. I keep hearing the subway and it really distracts me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really feel, I've felt that a lot lately. It's just like, it's about letting the other person be keep finding out who they are and not being threatened by it but embracing it like I heard a story today about somebody who said I'm on my 31st husband it's the same man but now he's gone into dementia and I'm learning how to it's harrowing I'm learning how to have fun with it like that's the 31st one you know what I mean and I'm, I'm not there yet thank you Jesus but um, it is of that nature that I'm talking about. It's like, what's your next iteration? Am I here for the ride or I'm not? And that's, that's kind of what it is to me. Embrace change. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Jim Parsons, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks.